Welcome back. I hope you found uh, yourself a little bit successful with using the meditative moment. I think that you'll, as you get more experience, as you get more practice, you'll get more used to it. You'll find it less strange. Think about that. Visualize that piece of bamboo that I that I showed you, and think about that as you do the that segmented exhalation. Just at first, do it for two, maybe three minutes. You'll find that to be plenty. You will find that thoughts will come crashing in on you like waves at the beach. And what I suggest is that you just allow them to do so. Just stand there. Just relax. You can't force thoughts not to come crashing in on you. But what you can do, I think, is allow them to wash over you and just keep on standing there. And I believe that with time, you will find that those waters will become more calm. That's what I suggest. So lots of practice when you're waiting for a bus, when you're waiting for a program to load on your computer, when you're waiting for co some coffee to be made or something of the sort, just do a little bit of that meditative moment, that bamboo breathing, for example. We'll be adding other techniques soon, but try the bamboo breathing and you'll find, I think, that with time, it becomes more and more pleasant, more a source of relaxation, more a way of concentrating on the moment and being more fully in the moment. And I've, my students over the years have almost all of them said that they very much appreciate the meditative moment that I've taught them how to experience. One student I was recently in touch with was saying that when he took my class here on the grounds of the University of Virginia in which we did a little bit of meditation, he found that one of the hardest things he had ever done because oh, he was always so busy being so full of activities and just having to sit and do very little was very difficult for him, but he found that that's a very useful skill that he didn't know how to appreciate before. All right, so I want to begin to move on into some basic material for the course. And that material has to do, of course, with nature of knowledge. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the nature of knowledge, and then I'll move on to some aspects of the self so that we can help put together the two into something like self-knowledge. So first of all, nature of knowledge. Knowledge is a state of the person, a state of the self. Rocks and trees, so far as we know, so far as we know, don't know anything. And also, knowledge is an achievement. That is to say, knowledge is something that you succeed in doing. You might try to do and not succeed, but generally speaking, it's something that you have to, so to speak, earn. In particular, believing something, as Plato knew a long time ago, as did his teacher Socrates, believing something is not enough to know it. I can believe all kinds of things, even though they aren't true and that, therefore, they would not be cases of knowledge. Furthermore, even if my belief is right, that doesn't make it true. So, I mean, let me try to get it. Even if my belief is right, that doesn't mean I know. So, for example, suppose that you asked me to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar in a room. I can't even see the jar, and I happen to get a very, make a very, very lucky guess. I say 342,719 jelly beans. And you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. You're right. You must have cheated. And I say, no, it was just a totally random, random guess, and I just happened to be right. People do get lucky sometimes. Now, even if I did believe that there were that many jelly beans in the jar, and even if that belief was true, that doesn't mean that I knew how many jelly beans were in the jar. That is to say, true belief, or what the ancient Greeks would have called true opinion, is not enough for knowledge. Knowledge has to be given with some kind of basis, some kind of evidence, some kind of support, some kind of reason that we need to be able to provide, or that something about us needs to be able to provide. And if I just make a lucky guess, I probably don't have that. So when we think about the nature of knowledge, it's not enough to believe. It's not enough to believe even if you're right. And in fact, it's not, not even enough to be certain. Many people are certain of things that they turn out to be wrong about, and so they couldn't have known those things in the first place. So knowledge requires truth of what it is that I claim to know. Belief, I've got to be committed to it. I've got to think that it's right. And then there's got to be something else. And philosophers have debated for quite a long time about what that something else is. But it's something like justification, support, what the ancients would have called an account. And so I want you to think about the nature of that special achievement known as knowledge. Now, when we talk about trying to know ourselves and not just the number of jelly beans in the jar or know the, 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 courses, the, the source or cause of certain disease or know who's going to win the next election, those are important things to know about as well. But if we're trying to think about how to know ourselves, a good starting point, I believe, is to understand the kind of self that we're talking about. And I want to first try to explain four different characteristics that, that stand out as important characteristics of a self. First of all, the first three in particular are aspects of what we might call your mind. The fourth is something more about your character. So about your mind, the first three. First of all, 
we like to, we philosophers, when we talk about a mind, like to talk about the cognitive aspect. That is number one is going to be the cognitive aspect. Then I'll come back in a moment to talk about the affective aspect. And then third will be the experiential. So back to the cognitive. The cognitive aspect of the mind has to do with what you believe, what you know, as we just discussed, information, and also memory. So if you know what your teacher's name was from the fifth grade, or how many people make up the population of Rwanda, those are bits of information that are part of the cognitive aspect of your mind. If you remember what you had for breakfast, or have a confident belief about what it is that's going on in the country next to yours, those are all cases that have to do with the cognitive aspect of the mind. Cogn the, the field known as cognitive psychology is very much concerned with the nature of the cognitive aspect of the mind. But the cognitive aspect of the mind should be distinguished from what I want to call the affective aspect. Aff the affective aspect of the mind has to do with emotions and moods. Moods, first of all. Moods are states of feeling that don't necessarily have any, let's call them content, they're just a rough way that you feel. So suppose, for example, that I've been drinking a lot of coffee, and drinking a lot of coffee causes me to be anxious. I have a general feeling of anxiety, and there might be, I might be able to know what my anxiety has brought, has, how my anxiety has been brought about, what caused it, but if somebody asks me, what are you anxious about? I probably won't have an answer to that question. I will just feel anxious. Likewise, if I'm surrounded by a bunch of happy people, I might begin to feel kind of exuberant, but that exuberance doesn't necessarily have to have a reason in the sense that I don't have to have anything that, I, that I'm exuberant about. I might just be exuberant because emotions have a funny way, or rather moods have a funny way of being kind of contagious. But these are moods. Moods should be distinguished from emotions, where emotions have what philosophers like to call a content. So think about the example of being regretful. You can be regretful, that would be an emotion, but if somebody says, what are you regretful about, you need to have an answer to that question, what it is you're regretting. If you answer the question by saying, oh, nothing in particular, I'm just feeling regretful, that wouldn't make very much sense. Likewise, for feeling hopeful, for being angry, it's hard to say how you can be angry unless you're angry about something in particular. So these attitudes that we're calling emotions are types of affect, types of affective state, but they are different from moods because there's always, always something that they're about. You can only be regretful about some particular thing, like for example, that you left the, left the keys in the car that you, just, that you just locked, or that you spoke unkindly to a person. Those are things you can be regretful about, and that's what makes them emotions as opposed to sheer moods. So in addition to the cognitive and affective dimensions of the mind, we also want to think about the, let's call them, experiential aspects of the mind. And by that I mean things having to do with items of, that are the results of sensation, perhaps the sensation of the external environment, or perhaps even sensation of things that are internal. So for example, suppose you're thinking about, or rather holding in your hand, a lemon that lemon will have a certain kind of feel, the rind will have a certain kind of feel to your skin, it will have a color, it will have a smell perhaps, a fragrance that will, it will give off. In each of these experiences that you have by when you're, when you're faced with a lemon in that intimate way will be an experiential component to the mind. There will be the way that it smells, the way that it looks, the way that it feels to your skin, and maybe even the way that it tastes. If you cut it open and take a bite of the inside, you'll find that very bitter Ex bitter taste filling your consciousness. Those three, those, those things are the experiential dimensions of the mind, part of what it's like to have an experience of an object. So, in the mind then, I've distinguished among the cognitive, the affective, and the, the experiential, I should say also that in a given moment of your mental life, those th three things will probably be fairly intertwined with each other. So, for example, suppose I'm holding a lemon. Then, in the cognitive sense, I'm aware of the fact that there's a piece of fruit in my hand. In the affective sense, maybe I will be reminded of the color of a dress worn by a woman I once took on a date or something like that. That might fill me with, with nostalgia or something, or maybe embarrassment, so it might produce emotions of various kinds. And then thirdly, I'll have that experience of, as I, as I said just a moment ago, the color of the skin, maybe it'll have the fragrance, maybe I'll notice the fragrance of the lemon, that'll also be an experiential thing. Maybe I'll break it open and take a bite out of it, I'll have that experience of something very sour, and so on. So a given bit of mental life will often have those three things intertwined. When you're walking down the street experiencing the, the sights and sounds 
events of things happening around you, all those things are probably going to be in effect. But I think for our purposes, it'll be useful to disentangle them. So that's what I want you to begin to do now, is to disentangle those three different strands. And then fourth, an aspect of the self that I would not call so much a part of your mind or a component of your mind, but still part of what makes you you, is character traits. So for example, think about the trait of being impatient, generous, empathetic, irascible, bad memory, having a bad memory, a good sense of humor, etc. Those character traits are aspects of you that are very important as we understand what, when we're trying to get to know someone that we have not met before, we're trying to learn about that person, we're often very interested in learning about what kind of character they have, what kind of character traits they have. And notice one thing important about those character traits is that they tend to be capable of being fairly dormant for a long period of time and only get activated under certain, certain circumstances. So for example, somebody might be brave and spend a whole lot of their life not getting a chance to show that bravery. But that bravery might finally show itself in a situation that calls for bravery, just as a grain of salt might spend a very long time sitting on a shelf without dissolving, but then put in an unsaturated fluid, lo and behold, it dissolves, sure enough. So too, a lot of our character traits have those, what, what philosophers like to call dispositional qualities too. That is to say, they often have qualities that, ha that can be there even if they're dormant. And then when a situation calls for them, calls upon them, they get activated. Likewise, an irascible person, you could be irascible and still be fast asleep and not acting in any irascible way. But then you wake up and something happens to test your patience and sure enough you swear or throw furniture or something of the sort that shows your irascibility. So it's important to keep in mind that character traits tend not to be visible to one another, to ourselves and to other people, by just a snapshot of a person. Generally speaking, those character traits only show themselves over time after we've shown what we do under various circumstances. That's a fourth aspect of the self. There's the three that are part of the mind, and then insofar as the self contains the mind. The fourth that's part of the self but not part of the mind I want to call character traits. And when we try to understand ourselves, it will be very important to keep those different things in mind and also keep in mind the question, to what extent do each of these four become a subject of difficult or easy, possible or impossible types of introspection? What's involved in learning about those four aspects of yourself? Is it hard? Is it difficult? What are the limitations? That will be a big, those will be a big, big topics for our discussions in the coming weeks. See you soon.